Welcome to the Hero Maker Podcast. I'm Andrea Shreeman, writer, director, EP, living in LA. I'm Jennifer Morrison, and I currently serve as the Commissioner of Public Safety for the state of Vermont. We are here to seek out and tell the full story of our friends who were murdered in college, Rachel Raver and Warren Fulton III. We really need to make sure that their deaths were not in vain and that every possible lesson and improvement for the system can be squeezed from the retelling of the circumstances that ultimately led to the identification of their killer. Hi. Hi. You look a lot like this little boy I know, Bentley. Oh, You mean my grandson, the adorable Bentley? You guys have a certain glow that's very similar. Oh, I think I glow because of him. But yeah, he does resemble me a little bit and my daughter. But yeah. Hey, listen, I'm really appreciative of you bringing us our guest today. I was not 100% sure exactly where this conversation would go. But having just wrapped up with him, I got to say that felt terrific to hear from somebody who has been both a prosecutor and a defense attorney. I think it really humanized for me a lot of the people who have to fill those roles, because if we don't have good qualified people on both sides, then justice really can't be served. And I really enjoyed talking with him. And in addition to having a good sense of humor, he was able to answer a lot of those questions that have been in my mind about the system generally, not about Rachel and Warren's case. Right. So we're talking about Josh Ritter, who our audience is about to hear from. And the reason that we decided to have Josh on was because We have gotten a yes. This is very exciting for us and for the audience. We've gotten a yes from a member of the defense team who defended Alfredo Prieto in the Virginia trials to come on and talk to us in a couple episodes from now. We haven't talked to this person yet, but we had some general questions about the system and what it is to be a defense attorney. Yeah, we don't want to waste the hour that we have with an actual member of the Prieto defense team asking some pretty baseline and mundane questions that could apply in any trial. Right. So Josh was terrific. So this is a totally mundane interview. No. (laughs) Yeah. Totally baseline. No, Josh was really excellent. I enjoyed hearing his perspective. I also enjoyed stumping him on one question. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. He works in Los Angeles and did work in the DA's office and on some very high profile cases early in his career and had some interesting insight to share on gangs. And yeah, so there's definitely some good meat here. We really enjoyed meeting you, Josh. We're very grateful that you came to educate us and that Jen could stump you. (laughs) And here we go. We're introducing our audience to private defense attorney, Joshua Ritter. Go, Josh. One of the things I was really excited about meeting Josh for is that he's been on, I don't know how you say it, both sides of the... The bar. Both sides of the bar, yeah. Yeah, so you've been in the district attorney's office. Yeah. And then you've also been on the defense side. Yes. So you have a unique point of view that I think could be very informative. Yeah, I hope so. I think it's given me a a unique perspective. I certainly think that I have a fuller perspective is probably the best word about how things work in the at least legal side of the criminal justice system than people who stayed on one side for their entire career. And I have friends on both sides who have stayed on their respective sides through their entire career. And and I will tell them that to their face. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I've got to believe that not only do you get valuable insight into what works or doesn't work, but that you more appreciate that it's not always about the wins and losses. Yeah. It's about the process working and about the integrity of the justice system, right? Yes. I think naive Jen back in her 20s when we were struggling so hard with no information about Rachel and Warren's case, this horrific life-changing crime happened and then we knew nothing for a long time. I think that naive Jen, who was also not a police officer then, would have reviled anyone who would be willing to represent a person like Alfredo Prieto. Yeah. So I'm sure you must have, in the course of your career as a defense attorney, dealt with some of that, Yeah, of people being like, how can you represent that animal? 
Yeah, I would say that that is from people, especially who are not lawyers or are lawyers and don't have any connection to the criminal justice system. That's probably the number one question I get is, how do you defend these people? And everybody thinks it's all about, oh, you have a person that you might know to be absolutely guilty sitting next to you. How do you get up and argue on behalf of that person? I'm not saying it's not a good question. I think it is a good question. And it's hard for a lot of people, I think, to wrap their heads around. And it was difficult for me even kind of wrestling with that question when I first got started as a defense attorney, because I was a prosecutor for 10 years. And before that, I had worked in the DA's office as a law clerk for about three years. So I thought that was just going to be my career. I I loved it. I mean, there wasn't something about being a prosecutor. There wasn't philosophically something about it that I disagreed with that I wanted out of the office. I left the office for a number of different reasons, but it certainly wasn't the work that I had grown tired of. It feels really good. Like you're putting on that white hat every single day and going out and putting the bad guys away and helping bring some closure and comfort to people who have suffered through some of the most unimaginable stuff you can think of. And so there was a little bit of trepidation, or not a little bit, a lot of trepidation on my part of, am I going to be able to handle that philosophically? Am I going to lose sleep over the fact of the people that I'm representing? And one thing that I quickly realized is that I wasn't going from I think it would have been different if I had gone from DA to public defender, because public defenders are, for the most part, dealing with people who are kind of career criminals and people who have led a life where they've damaged a a lot of other people's lives. Going into private defense, just by the nature of it, that you're being hired by someone tends to be people who, what I found, were folks that I could easily see myself having a drink with. I mean, these were not horrible, bad people. They had made a really profound mistake in their lives for whatever reason. They got too greedy. They got sloppy. They drank too much. They made some decisions and not trying to excuse that. They made really horrible decisions. But for the grace of God, I could see myself making some of those mistakes in a prior life and having the troubles that they were. And then you do have people who are who are awful. And how do you represent someone who has done something that you just in no way can find to be excusable and in no way can you empathize with? And I think what you do is you kind of say to yourself, this isn't about me trying to get a really horrible person, quote unquote, off. This is me making sure that the system is working properly. And the system doesn't work properly if they don't have somebody representing them. And so I'm really doing law enforcement as far as enforcing the Constitution and making sure that the prosecution and police officers have followed the rules to get to where they're at. And I can be zealous about that and I can advocate on their behalf, but I can also sleep well at night knowing that it's not about dirty tricks and trying to fool people to get some horrible person off, but sometimes it's just about making sure that shepherding them through the criminal justice system, they're not having their rights trampled on somewhere along the way. Yeah, that's a really healthy perspective to be a bit dispassionate about it, but understand the significance of the role because the system, the justice system has so many moving parts to it. And if any one part isn't working right, then it really is not just at all. No, 100%. I've always wondered this question and never had an opportunity to ask it. So I want to ask you, do you ask your clients if they did it? Uh, More than that, I tell them, tell me everything. I think it's important for me to know know, where where are the bodies because I cannot defend them properly if I'm going to be caught off guard by stuff. And so it's not like you might imagine where you sit down and and you kind of go, so... So did you did you do it? I mean, usually they're <laughs> well. That's how it goes on the movie, <laughs> <laughs> right? Usually they're pretty forthcoming about their involvement. You know, I think I'm experienced enough now to know when people are holding stuff back or when they're adding their own artistic flair to how things may have taken place. And I tell them, I, I say, listen, this is an attorney client privilege conversation. I go to the grave with whatever you tell me right now. It's not going to go beyond these four walls of my office. But I need to know everything because the worst thing for you is to hide something for me, thinking that you're hiding it from the world and we get blindsided by it and I can't do anything about it ahead of time. So yes, it's important that you tell me everything that took place. And this, you know, I tell them this is not about judgment. 
they're going to tell me some stuff that they probably not told anyone. And I want them to feel comfortable about that. And still, sometimes people just can't help themselves and, and hold back and don't tell you the entire truth. And I've been caught more than once in a situation where I realize when it's too late that my client was far more involved than they let on in our initial conversations. Sure. Well, I mean, it is the human condition to minimize. To, it's the human nature to minimize your culpability. So it's almost like people can't help themselves. No, they can't. And in spite of what I said about a lot of these people I think are good folks, some of them are people who've got really serious problems that have led them to make those decisions. And that character flaw includes having a revisionist view of the past and their involvement and what they did. And they, yeah, they have survived for so long, perhaps, on telling lies and twisting things that they can't help themselves even when they're sitting in front of their own attorney. So it's almost like a, a window into human nature. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and that whole idea of like culpability and guilt and shame and kind of the way that people manipulate to live with themselves, which is actually a nice segue. What is the most conflicted you've ever felt without giving major details? What's the most conflicted you've ever felt defending someone that you heard enough information to know that maybe they weren't such a great person or yeah. it wasn't an accident or yeah, yeah there i mean there are a few cases where i was not proud to be representing a certain person one case in particular involved a man who had been taking sexual advantage of a minor and he ended up going to jail there was no kind of getting him out of this uh, he was very guilty and there was a lot of proof of it and I did the best that I could to try to negotiate with the DA. It was more about give me an offer that I can convince him to take so that this doesn't turn into something where we're all going to trial over something that we know is just going to be an, an exercise in futility on my part. And let's avoid further traumatizing people who have been involved in this. And let's help me get him to a place where he can accept that plea and I can argue to him why he should accept that. I think justice was done. I think any outsider looking in would feel that we did come to a appropriate plea agreement. But that was also early on in my career as a defense attorney. And I got to tell you that when you're in court, they don't read out what your client did in open court. But anybody who's looking at the docket and following along can see the list of crimes that they're charged with. And when you see certain numbers in the penal code, everybody knows what we're talking about. And to be standing up in court representing that person, I cannot say I was very proud to be doing that. But I feel like I did my job like I should have done. Do you think that your peers in the defense bar contemplate on the regular things like, let's not subject this victim to having to testify again. Let's not re-traumatize victims. Let me rephrase that question. Do you think in the arc of your career that the knowledge of the impact on victims by having them repeat their story over and over has changed? Um, well, if I understand your question, I th you're talking about my personal arc? Well, I'm, it strikes me that perhaps at the beginning of your career, we weren't treating victims as carefully as we treat them now. Right. And it was not uncommon for the victim to have to provide a forensic interview to law enforcement and then another one to Child Protective Services yeah. and then be interviewed by their own attorneys and then be cross-examined by a defense attorney. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you witnessed a bit of a shift in the course of your career about how we handle traumatized youth in particular, but it could be any victim of a personal crime. Yes, absolutely. I And I think that continues to evolve. Yeah. Many years ago, you would have victim advocates, but they were kind of understaffed and overwhelmed with the amount of people. And though you do receive some training on that when you first enter the office, I don't think it's enough training. And there probably isn't enough training that you can have. You have to kind of experience it and have some empathy and understanding for what these people are going through. And and it starts immediately, your experience with that. I mean, when you first join the DA's office, they're not throwing you into felonies. In Los Angeles in particular, you're doing a bunch of low-level misdemeanors, but even low-level misdemeanors can include these types of crimes. And I had, I remember, a misdemeanor case where it was involving young girls who were 
being attacked on their way to school. They would walk to school and this guy on more than one occasion would just kind of run out of the bushes, grope them over their clothes and then take off running. And because of the level of the conduct, it wasn't enough for a felony. So you had a string of misdemeanors and I had all of these young women who I needed to testify. And naively, I just thought, okay, well, let's get them into court. I'll tell them what's going on. I'll tell them what to expect when they testify, and then we'll get through all of this and and I can handle this case. And they were complete messes beforehand. I mean, they were this was so traumatic to them. In my head, ignorantly was thinking, well, it's not come on, we're not talking about anything all that bad. And I didn't have a full understanding of how even something that in the grander scheme of things, as far as how serious crimes can get, wasn't that bad. To them, it was incredibly traumatic. They also didn't want to get in front of a bunch of strangers and talk about it and have a judge there and 12 people staring at them and a defense attorney asking them a bunch of questions. So that was a real life lesson early on for me that, yeah, you really, you do need to talk to these people and you do need to consider what you're putting them through and is it worth it? And I always think it's worth it to try to get justice and a conviction and to stop somebody from doing what they're doing. And that's ultimately what I tried to convince them of more than anything is we need to stop this person. I hate for what you've gone through, but try to draw some strength of the fact that he's not going to do it to other people if you're able to have the courage to deal with this now. And eventually we were able to get a conviction against him. And I think it was helpful because I think, you know, that guy though, that was misdemeanor level stuff at that point, that's just training grounds for him. And I could easily see him turning into somebody far more dangerous later on. Was there ever anybody in the system in that particular case who was a victim's advocate or could help you understand the scope of of that and to support them? Or did that just not exist in this case? I mean, there was a victim advocate, but like I said, they were kind of Um, they're overworked and overwhelmed themselves. And my case is not a four victim rape that the person is looking at life in prison. This is a misdemeanor. So they didn't have kind of the amount of attention that they could give to it. But part of your question from earlier is how has that evolved? I think that one, that you're seeing far more resources being put towards victim advocates, far better kind of training for them to handle the caseload that they're dealing with. But I also think that just as our understanding of all of that continues to kind of grow, I hope, my hope is that the training for the DAs is more of a conscientiousness towards that. And certainly the LA District Attorney's Office has an entire division devoted to sex crimes. And the people who are in that unit are very experienced and they receive a lot of training and they're very good at what they do but that came with a lot of experience and a lot of training beforehand to get to that point, which you would hope that they would kind of understand the need for that even in the lower level crimes and throughout the office that everybody should probably have a better background in that. Do defense attorneys have to take training on topics like you know, trauma-informed cross-examination or anything like that? No, no. I, I don't believe there's any kind of program like that in the public defender's office, and certainly private defense has nothing like that. I know some defense attorneys who are very conscientious of it. I know others who are these dyed-in-the-wool true believer that don't see, hey, I'm just defending my client and let the repercussions fall where they may. And it's unfortunate. And I think also that an unfortunate side of it is that you mainly hear from some defense attorneys is just kind of a discussion of, well, how do you handle those witnesses when they're on the stand? How do you walk that fine line of both being kind of delicate only for appearances sake for the jurors so that you don't come across as being some sort of creep, Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, get effective cross-examination and I'm not trying to throw my, my colleagues under the bus and what I do for a living, but I don't believe that is the right approach. Sometimes you have to do it and something's going to go to trial whether you like it or not. And you're going to have to be cross-examining someone and you have to do your job, but there's a balancing act that can take place where you can do your job. And at the same time, realize that this person is saying and believes that they've been through something really horrific at the hands of your client.
If you or someone you know is connected either personally or as the result of violent crime to Alfredo Prieto, a convicted rapist and killer who lived in and around San Bernardino, California, Arlington, Virginia, and Jamaica, Queens, New York, between the years of 1984 and 1990, we'd like to hear from you. Please email us at info at theheromakerpodcast.com. When you think about the folks that you've defended, do you see a large percentage of them who share with you or who you become aware of had trauma in their own background? Yes. Not as much discussion about it as you would think. That kind of comes up in the initial conversations where they're trying to kind of make excuses for some things and they might bring up some of that. I have had some clients where in preparation of a mitigation packet that I might want to present to the DA's office, I'll have them go through therapy. I had a client recently who went into some live-in therapy for months where he did a lot of talking about his background that we turned over some of that, some final reports that we felt comfortable enough to turn over to the DA's office in order to have a more fulsome conversation with them about trying to arrive at a plea deal. Sometimes people start to talk about it and I tell them, listen, I'm not your therapist. This is above my pay grade. I do think you need to talk to someone. Same with substance abuse. Sure. I do think you have a problem. I do think you need to talk to someone. I'm not that person, but I encourage you to do it. But it, it comes up for sure. Would it come up more often, as you said, in sentencing when they're evaluating the mitigating factors or anything like that? Would it be more likely to be relevant at sentencing rather than in the actual facts of the case? Yeah, there's rarely an opportunity for it to present itself in the actual trial. Usually the background of the defendant isn't all that material to whether or not they committed the crime unless the prosecution has called their past character into question through witnesses or evidence that they've presented, then that kind of opens the door sometimes. But usually it's either in discussions with the DA ahead of time, you want them to know who this person is and how they became the person that we're dealing with now. And certainly at sentencing, you want the judge to have as much of an understanding of all the kind of mitigating factors before they make their decision. Makes sense. I really appreciate that you were kind of helping us see some of the weaknesses around how prepared attorneys are for the emotional side of witness testimony. I seem to hear things that the system is a system. And in order to succeed on either side of the bar, you kind of have to understand it well enough to find the loopholes and get as much traction as you can. And I would say that in our friend's murder case, we've heard a lot about the tactics of the defense team and really pushing the system as much as they could, even after the guy was convicted, helping him when he was in prison and trying to get as much for him as possible. To me, it seems like that doesn't benefit society. It doesn't benefit the people who are in court, the defendants or the witnesses or the people who have been hurt, the victims. It doesn't benefit the actual human beings who are at the crux of these crimes. I guess I'd just love for you to speak to any weaknesses that you see that are glaring for you within the system that, hey, if we just did this one or two things, I think we could really benefit everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Well... First, I think what you're talking about is a phenomenon that I have certainly noticed where, especially in murder cases, when a murder first takes place, all of our sympathy and thoughts go out to the victim. And in the initial media reports, all we're thinking about is, oh my God, this horrible murder and and how these people were killed and the families affected and everything else. But then as time goes by and that defendant begins to work their way through the criminal justice system, everyone's attention seems to turn towards the defendant. And people start to talk about how is this person's life going to be affected? And oh, they're looking at LWAP, life without parole. They're going to go to prison for the rest of their lives. And oh, they're looking at the death penalty. And wow, they might be sentenced to death. And it seems like so much attention is put on them. And because the victim's no longer with us, or their family may be there, but maybe not. It's almost like they have now become forgotten. And it's like this thing was done to this person, but now we're dealing with this defendant. And I think that is really 
unfortunate. And I don't know if there is a way of correcting that. I think it's just kind of human nature to deal with the person that you see in front of you. And that happens to be the person in the jumpsuit who's shuffling into court in handcuffs is the one that everybody's thinking about. But to answer kind of your question, I think it was your question about where do I see flaws in the system and where do I think changes could be made? You know, we talked a little bit before and I thought about that since our last conversation. A couple of things that really stood out to me are one, policy-wise, and another, I think, just attitude-wise. And policy-wise, I really have a problem with any kind of blanket policy. And we see that both in the way things are legislated. I think that our legislatures can be really reactionary to things. A horrible crime takes place, and then in the next legislative session, you'll see a bunch of mandatory minimums on that type of a crime and a bunch of allegations that are added to those types of crimes that make the sentencing laws related to those types of crimes very draconian. I don't think that's a great way of handling things. And you also see it on the other side where here in Los Angeles, we have a DA right now who is seen to be very progressive describes himself that way and has a bunch of blanket policies on what crimes are going to be charged, whether or not bail is going to be applied to anyone, whether or not juveniles will ever be tried as adults, whether or not strikes will ever be alleged. And I just think blanket policies are just not the way to conduct business in the criminal justice system because you're dealing with individuals who committed individual crimes and every case needs to have discretion involved in it. So both on the legal side, the the sentencing side, when you have these mandatory minimums, it creates havoc because now a DA's hands are tied as far as negotiating and you have things going to trial that maybe don't need to go to trial because even though it satisfies the elements of a certain crime, it really doesn't reflect the conduct. And the same with on the prosecution side, when you start to see some of these DA's who say, I'm not going to prosecute any of these types of misdemeanors, or I'm going to not apply bail at all. I mean, it's just ridiculous that you're not going to say on an individual basis, I need the DA in court who's dealing with that to be considering that individually. Jen, this is the stuff that Bill Bratton had talked about, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Where all of a sudden, when you're not prosecuting a certain crime... That crime, boom, goes up because everybody on the street is like, woohoo. 100%. But I'm sure Jen has a lot to say about this, actually. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. I'm I'm listening to Josh and I'm just like, keep talking. (laughs) And to your point, Andrea, there in recent cases, there are jailhouse phone calls with inmates who talk about understanding the sentencing laws and guidelines and what the new DA is doing and how they can find loopholes. They absolutely pay attention to that type of stuff and conduct themselves accordingly, I'll say. But to just kind of close the loop on that, your original question, the other side of this is the attitude side. And I think what happens, and I saw it happening to myself, but when you're in the system One, you get this mentality of just kind of moving things down the conveyor belt. And you see case after case where it's a person with a rap sheet as long as your arm, and you begin to view every single person who comes into court as a quote unquote criminal. And you lose sight of any kind of individuality on that person's part. And the same with the defense. It becomes about winning and it becomes about their personal vendetta against the DA's office or something. And I think what they do in the in the military with JAG, where they serve both sides of the bench. Sometimes they're defending a case and other times they're prosecuting a case. I, I love that system because it just provides you with so much perspective on how to handle these cases, which I think is also a flaw because you talk about forgetting about victims. Well, you're, you're also forgetting about defendants and other people's lives that may be affected. And if all you're doing is sitting there, and it's happened to me, where you're just thinking about how do I win this case because it's an adversarial environment. So you're trying to win, no doubt about it. And you're losing sight of how this isn't about an exchange of money. This is about people's lives. Yeah. The entrenchment yeah. is tough, particularly when you've been doing either side or any job for a long time. But the piece that also exists, and I'm sure you were in the midst of it, maybe still are, is the politicization of outcomes in the justice system. And when you started talking about blanket policies and knee-jerk reactions to what might be a short burst or or short trend of a certain type of crime, that's really relatable because I think that's what we're doing right now is I think we legislate based on feelings and fear, not on facts, not on data. 
I think that we respond with trying to put these uniform policies over a whole array of behaviors and underlying root causes that are not the same. There's no two cases I've ever investigated, even noise complaints, right? Like the (laughs) bane of a college town cop's existence, the noise complaints. No two were ever the same, right? Right. There are no two victims or perpetrators who are the same. And we try to put all these wiggly shaped jello blocks through a square hole. Yeah. And done work. Yeah. So I really appreciate what you said about both knee jerk reactions to high profile incidents that occur yeah. and blanket policies. Yeah. And the fact that the legislature really more is less with yeah. certain things. Yeah. Sorry, right. less is more. Andrea, something you you had said too about your friend's case that I wanted to just kind of comment on about how the defense tactics that you guys have seen and kind of uncovered in your journey here, you especially see that, I think, in death penalty cases because I've never handled a death penalty case from the defense side. I've worked on a couple from the prosecution side as a law clerk, but I've never handled it from the defense side. But from what I've seen, they truly believe that it's no holds barred at this point because the way that they view it is the government is trying to put my client to death and my job is to save his life. And if your job is to save someone's life, what are you not going to do to save someone's life? I'm not surprised at the tactics that they would take and how far they would go and the lengths that they would go because I think that's the way that they view it in their own heads, there's a righteousness to trying to save this person's life. Yeah. Especially in this situation, I think you would kind of have to couch it that way. You would have to give yourself a moral reason to even defend the person Yeah, when the DNA says one in 7 billion people committed these heinous, disgusting crimes. Before really diving into this and really spending time with this case and the experience of what really happened to Rachel and Warren and the other now eight people that we are aware of, I probably would have said as like a hippie leftist Topanga (laughs) Hollywood person, um, no death penalty. Right, right. People can change. We should give them the opportunity. But somehow in the experience of knowing that he was defended so rigorously and getting more detail than I had ever had in the past of his monstrous acts, I then react to, oh, you want to save this guy's life? Screw you. If anybody in the world should have received a death penalty, it's him. That's what it's there for. It's almost like, I think because it feels competitive in a way. You did this? Fuck you. You take that. (laughs) You know? And and I lose all my sense of who I actually internally am. (laughs) You know? 100%. It's just really weird. Yeah. It does feel, I don't know. Did you guys watch any of the Nicholas Cruz uh, trial? It was just on the penalty phase. He's the Parkland, Stoneman, Stoneman Douglas High School, the shooter in Florida that killed 17 people, I think it was. Yeah. He pled guilty to everything. The guilt phase was satisfied. He was guilty on everything. And they just had a trial on the penalty phase on whether or not to put him to death. I bring that up because the vitriol between his defense attorneys and the prosecution and even the judge for people who were watching it, and I was one of the people watching it because I was giving commentary on it and everything, it was pretty astounding. The inflamed emotions from everyone, including his own defense team. And like you said, here's a person who took innocent lives over the most horrible of reasons to be glorified, essentially. And his attorneys were sitting there like they were fighting the most righteous of fights because in their view, they're trying to save his life. Yeah. That's what happens when we operate from feelings, not facts. Yeah. A hundred percent. And it's hard. I mean, so can you talk to me a little bit about types of attorneys. I'm thinking prosecutors and defense attorneys, not intellectual property attorneys and patent attorneys and stuff like that. In policing, for example, there's stereotypes of certain types of cops. There's the ones who are full of dip and swagger and lift weights all the time and are always trying out for the SWAT team. And then there's some who are much different personality types, much quieter, use their soft skills, their communication skills, 
there's the real nerds who are leveraging technology all the time and are really into the forensics, et cetera. Are there like archetypes within prosecutors and defense attorneys? And can you tell us a little bit about some of them? Oh, yeah. One of the biggest is we have a term for it. When you refer to someone as a true believer, whether defense or prosecution, what you're saying is essentially that person doesn't really have any perspective. And that if they're a true believer as a defense attorney, meaning they've never represented a guilty person in their entire life, and the government is always corrupt, and every single cop has lied on every single police report ever, and all evidence has always been planted. And that's a that's a true believer. And they would have the same phrase for people who are prosecutors as being a true believer in the, just the opposite of that. No cop has ever flubbed a police report Every single defendant is guilty of everything and probably then some. And so it's, yeah, it's these people who have become so polarized in their mindset on how they approach their work that it almost becomes part of their identity. It does, doesn't almost become, it is part of their identity. And I wonder too how much of that is born or bred into them because I think some people choose obviously these different professions for a different reason. I, I never wanted to become a public defender because I just couldn't see myself doing that. But now here I am as a private defense attorney. But I think some people who gravitate towards prosecution or towards defense kind of lean to those perspective sides. So they just might have been always that way. But then I think you use the term entrenched, I think is a perfect way of describing it. The more and more they're in this job, the more and more they kind of become so cynical and jaded that they do begin to believe that stuff. I mean, it's not hyperbolic. I've dealt with defense attorneys when I was a prosecutor who would say stuff. I would be talking to him about a case and I'd say, well, the cop said ABC. And he, and he goes, oh, oh, you're you're going to believe the police officer? You can believe that took place? And I'm like, come on, man. You think this cop is putting his badge on the line over saying that your client dropped a dime bag of crack cocaine on the curb. I mean, come on, like, you know, what are we doing here? But there are people who, in their view, have never seen a clean cop in their entire lives. (laughs) It also strikes me that maybe not in the big cities, but it's got to be so in a place like Vermont or a smaller city, smaller venue, that there's only so many prosecutors and only so many defense attorneys that it must become a little competitive between the attorneys, regardless of who the victim or the accused is. Yeah. No, even in a prosecuting office like LA, it's the largest prosecuting office in the country. But at the same time, it's still a small enough community that, yeah, you would know these defense attorneys if you didn't know them personally by reputation. I had several trials against the same attorney. You know, it it would just be that way. You'd be assigned to a certain courthouse or just making your way around the county. You began to know a a lot of people. And yeah, people carry a reputation. And to get a, a win against a certain attorney might mean something different than to get a win against another attorney. And it definitely does for some people. And I don't want to make it sound like the majority of them. I think the majority of people on both sides are a little more even handed. But for some of them, it was just about winning. Yep. It's human nature. Yeah. The Williamson County Cultural Arts Commission of Franklin, Tennessee, wishes to thank our men and women in blue who help us deliver safe and fun family and community cultural events year round, including one of the only authentic bluegrass festivals in the country. Bluegrass Along the Harvest takes place every July and at the Williamson County Fair in August and at the annual Tennessee International Independent Film Festival. Check out our full calendar of events at wccac-tn.org. What made you want to be an attorney? What's your journey? How did you get to law school? Where'd you go to law school? And And I believe you're in practice with your brother now, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, I am. Uh, I think I fought being an attorney for most of my life. My dad was an attorney. My brother's an attorney. I went to college with no intention of going to law school. And then when I got out of college, there weren't many career prospects for my creative writing degree from UCLA. So I thought, okay, I need to figure something out here and eventually went to law school. And I I love doing it and I love being a lawyer. 
it wasn't like I was a little kid growing up thinking that's what I want to do. But then even when I was in law school, I knew I liked trial work. I knew that I didn't want to be sitting behind a computer writing briefs all day long and that I wanted to be in court advocating. And I thought that I wanted to go into civil practice because in my view, it was like, well, if I'm going to be a lawyer, that's where you're going to make money is doing that. So I'll be a trial lawyer in civil practice, which is what my dad was and what my brother currently does. And then I got involved in a trial advocacy program at law school that part of the program was you do a class for one semester and the next semester they place you as a intern at the DA's office and you do preliminary hearings on the record and you kind of learn these things. And I remember I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do that part of it because I had no interest in being a DA because in my view, I don't know where I got this from, but I thought of DAs as kind of like people who had failed to get other careers or something. It was in my view, it was like like this government job that you end up in because you couldn't get hired in private practice somewhere. I don't know why I thought that way. But then when I went and did my internship, the DAs I were working with were all these young, super bright people who were really good at their job. And what they were doing was kind of badass. And I was like, okay, this is kind of cool. And then I went from there to I did a law clerk position in what's called the Major Crimes Division in Los Angeles, which handles all of the cases that make the news that you hear about. OJ Simpson was through Major Crimes and Robert Blake was through Major Crimes. And I worked on some very interesting cases. And then the last case I worked on is I was a law clerk for the prosecution of Phil Spector Yeah, uh, when he was eventually convicted. So that gave me this next level of experience with how one, you can be practicing law at the very highest level and certainly trial work at the very highest level and with very, very bright, ambitious people. And I was hooked. So I applied to the DA's office, started as a prosecutor for about 10 years there. But then, you know, it is government work. And I remember one of the real frustrations I had was nobody becomes a DA for the money but you at least want to get the experience out of it. Yeah. So I became frustrated because of budget reasons. They weren't giving out promotions. And promotions in the DA's office are not based on how good you are. They're just based on seniority and if they have the money. And then they'll just promote a bunch of people. And then you become from a grade two to a grade three. But the problem is that they would then attach your ability to work in special units to what grade you were. So me and a bunch of the people I was hired with were stuck as grade twos for years longer than we usually would have been in different budget times. And therefore, we couldn't go to any of these special units. And I wanted to go to what has now been dismantled. But at the time, there was a unit called Hardcore Gangs, which deals with all of the major gangs in Los Angeles. And it's all murders and just horrible stuff. But it's one of the elite units to be in. And the head deputy of that unit had been talking to me and wanted to recruit me and wanted me to come over and thought I was ready and all of this other kind of stuff. And I was being told by our administration that, oh, well, yeah, but you know, he's a two, so we can't bring him over there because he's got to be a three to bring him over. And the only reason I wasn't a three was because of the budget. I was kind of like, okay, this is fun and all, but your career ambitions are not really something that's considered. So eventually an opportunity. Perfect time to jump the bar. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, around that time. And now that I have that phrase, I'm going to say that all the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jumping the bar. I love it. Exactly. I have a question though. Do you have gang knowledge, Los Angeles gang knowledge? I mean, it was obviously an interest of yours. We have not gotten deep into PNS, um, Pomona Northside, which is the gang that Alfredo Prieto was in. I always found it interesting that on the West Coast, he was part of this gang, and it made the families kind of searching for answers. It gave a whole different world of threat to them so that they were limited in terms of what they could do. And that the East Coast events, there didn't seem to be that gang layer. Yeah. He seemed to be kind of operating alone. I mean, he's still connected, obviously, but the people on the East Coast, or at least Rachel's brother and sister, that family, they had a lot more yeah. freedom in terms of how they could maneuver and seek answers without that threat. That was one of the things that I always found interesting. And then that the gangs also, they operate inside the jail system as well. 
so that even when you get to the inside, you know, depending on the crimes you've committed, you could be, you know, you could be a target. There's just so much yeah. different stuff, I guess, that comes into play. In fact, they probably have more influence even over how things are operated on the street from inside of the jails. That's really their power center is inside of the jails because all of these gang members are likely going to end up in jail at some point. And so if you don't follow the rules on the street, you may not pay for it on the street, but when you get hooked up for some drug possession or weapons possession or something like that, you're going to go inside jail and guess who's waiting for you is a bunch of people who are going to perhaps correct your behavior for what took place outside of jail. So it is hard to kind of explain to people who either didn't grow up in Los Angeles or just don't have any experience with gangs whatsoever that in these communities, especially where gangs have a stranglehold, people absolutely operate in fear. In fact, the vast majority of people living in these neighborhoods that are high gang areas are not in gangs, but the minority of the people who are in gangs are able to deal in that currency of fear enough that they, yeah, I totally understand. That was a major problem in dealing with gang cases is getting people to cooperate because they were fearful of going back home and what could happen. And relocating people or providing them with resources was a very common thing. I have to circle back to something yeah. that's not gang related that I've been dying to ask <laughs> since you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Has your creative writing degree been helpful as you crafted opening or closing <laughs> remarks? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, wait, while you're while you're digesting that coffee there, I did want to say when you talked about how you were like, no, not the DA's office. Like, I'm definitely not going there. That was classic Joseph Campbell refusal of the call. Right. And we also heard that with Sally Fayez. It was suggested to her that she needed to see in early, early, early in her career what happened on the victim side. She was like, No way, I'm not dealing with the victims. Like, this is what I do. And now her whole life is She's the director of victim services and she's innovative. And so anyway, classic Joseph Campbell, please answer <laughs> Jennifer's question. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I mean, maybe I add more flourishes of metaphor or something like that into my opening or closing than other people would. But I think, uh, well, I'll tell you why. I went to college and I decided on a English degree because it didn't involve math. And then I decided on a creative writing degree because then I could avoid reading Chaucer's Tales in the Old English. So my, 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 <laughs> my college career was based upon finding the path of least resistance. <laughs> I just, I couldn't, when you said that, I was like, oh, that's, that is actually a foundational <laughs> skill that he could translate into. But, right. um, and where did you go to right. law school? Out in L.A.? I went to law school at Loyola here in Los Angeles and undergrad at UCLA. Gotcha. Have you ever lived anywhere else in the country? You've been always LA centric. I lived in Chicago for four years after college and before law school. I lived in Chicago. Nice. I wanted to also circle back to one other question I had written down. I think we've established that defense attorneys are not required to take any trainings, but do you think they should be required to take certain trainings if they are criminal defense attorneys? God, that's a good question. Um, wow. You know, I think they should in certain cases. I think they should. A lot of people, when they leave law school, they decide they're going to hang up their own shingle and just practice law. They start a law firm of themselves and practice law. And usually the stuff that they begin to pick up is criminal stuff because you can say that you practice that and people are just looking for a lawyer and personal injury type stuff. And so you see people kind of practicing those two things. Nobody goes into, you know, mm -hmm. starts their own practice and then they're doing mergers and acquisitions or something like that. It's just kind of this lower entry level stuff. And usually what they're doing is DUIs and bar fights and kind of low level misdemeanor stuff. Maybe you'll get into some felony behavior and armed robbery or something like that. But maybe there should be some training or some extra certification or something to handle cases that involve a certain level of sensitivity, sex crimes involving minors, 
or just general sex crimes, crimes involving murder and where death penalty is on the line. What's funny is that in Los Angeles, I don't know if they have it in smaller jurisdictions, but you have the public defender's office, which is a government job funded by the county. Then you have the alternate public defender's office, which is where if there's a conflict on a case and the public defender's office can't take it, or there's multiple defendants and you can't all have it by the public defender's office, they'll assign one of the defendants to the alternate public defender, which is also government funded. But then if they run out of that, they go to what's called bar panel, which is private attorneys who've signed up for it. And in the bar panel, they assign you cases based on your level of experience. So if you're on bar panel and you're a first level lawyer, you're not going to get a murder case. You're going to have to be so many years of experience or so many trials before they start to assign you those types of cases. But if you are right out of law school and some guy wants to go hire you and hire you privately, you're allowed to represent them in anything. There is absolutely nothing preventing you from being a first year law grad and representing somebody on a death penalty case because you are seen to be a lawyer. You're an accredited lawyer and there's no extra accreditation that you need to represent that person, which I I don't know if that's a great idea. Well, doesn't it seem a little odd to you that the only actors in the justice system that are continually subjected to more and more and more training requirements are the police? Yeah. <laughs> uh, no. I mean, the judges aren't getting assigned all this extra training. The prosecutors aren't. The defense attorneys aren't. I mean, they- It just, it's, it, there's no end to yeah. the unfunded training mandates that keep getting sent our way. Yeah. No, I agree with you. I mean, as a prosecutor, we did get training, but it wasn't some sort of mandate that we had to do it or that we don't qualify for our job. Judges, I know, go to judges college every single year that they go to and receive some training. But again, it's not like there's some sort of- legal mandate, like the same that falls on police. I, yeah, I agree with you. I, th I think of it as having to deal with the public, Jen, you know, I think because as soon as you said it, I was like, oh, and teachers, teachers or educators are all, always having to get like trainings to be able to keep their status or whatever. So I wonder if it has to do with dealing with the public. Well, they're also the ones that get their the finger pointed at them first, too. When something goes wrong, it's always the police's fault, according to everyone else, I'm saying. Right, right. It may not be true, but there's where they point the finger is that the police screwed up. So when politicians want to show that they're correcting that problem, they're going after the police. Rarely are they saying, we need to get rid of that judge or that prosecutor. Oh, I love how innocent you're being right now, Josh. I mean, you told us at the beginning in this interview that that's what you basically do is you go in and you're like, I'm going to tell you how the cops messed up. So my client should be off. <laughs> right. That's your job. Right. Exactly. Listen, the police are given certain authority that requires extensive training. We are authorized to use force against our fellow man to enforce the laws on behalf of the government. So there is a weighty burden that requires intense training. However, we are also required to take extensive training in fair and impartial policing, making decisions without letting bias cloud your thinking right, uh, right. about the impacts of disparate treatment and about how we're one cog in this wheel. And yeah. if we're really trying to reduce the inequities of racial disparities and others, not just not just race, but socioeconomic disparities, right. why are the cops who are the tip of the spear, the only ones who are being required to take training to create a more just and trauma-informed justice system? Well, don't you think a lot of that is just messaging too for the chief of your department or the mayor or whoever to say, well, look at all this training that we're having everyone do. And and we every single one of these officers has gone through XYZ training. And don't don't you think that that's a lot of it is just kind of the the optics of it? Well, a lot of it is required by statute. In Vermont anyway, there's an ever growing slate of required trainings that the law enforcement personnel are required to take on. Because there's no lack of popularity in politicians pushing for that type of legislation. That's correct. But why? anyway, I just find it ironic that there's no, so agree many with pieces you. of the system yeah. that can impact the outcome. And really what we're talking about is disparate outcomes of prosecution, disparate rates of incarceration of various offenders. And somehow that's all the police's fault when it's right. a lot of system steps behind the police action that determine the outcome of a case. A hundred percent. I agree. 
All right, we'll get busy on working on that. <laughs> <laughs> Josh, is there anything that we didn't touch on today that you had taken into consideration that you maybe thought about this week that you maybe want to leave us with? I'm just looking through the questions that you sent. I think we touched on all of this. Yeah. I mean, unless there was something else that you guys thought we missed, but I think we talked, got it all. Oh, we've been going for about an hour. Yeah. I think we covered everything. Yeah. Yeah. It was a good conversation, but I super (laughs) appreciate the fact that you're completely not involved in Rachel and Warren's or any of the related cases. And it gives us an opportunity to just like ask our curious questions that we don't really have anyone else to ask of them. Yeah. So ask the questions. Oh, good. I hope it was helpful. It's definitely helpful. It's all part of a journey. We're on a, we're on a journey, right, Andrea? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, for sure. Learning a lot of stuff, healing, meeting awesome folks like you out there doing good. (laughs) Oh, thank you. And it's really nice when you meet someone who, has served on both sides of the bar and really has a good, healthy perspective like you do. And it helps us all. I think anyone who's listening will be restored a bit in their faith in the system because people like you who are balanced and see both sides of it, we need way more of that. And I agree with you the way JAG does it, where you're not allowed to get entrenched in your identity on one side or another, but you are to apply the law and ensure the system works and you are given the side that you represent. It's a little bit like debate team, right? Yeah. You don't know if you're going to be for or against the topic. You just know that this is going to be the topic. Yeah. And I would love to see us shake things up a little bit in America that way. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for the kind words. I appreciate that. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. It was great to meet you. Very nice to meet you both. Thank you, Vicki Rose Sampson, our beloved sound mixer and editor. Thanks also to producer Michael Doherty, who distributes and markets the show. Thanks to graphic designer Junglene Bay and sound designer Andy Bill. And thanks to Andrea Schreeman. Yep, that's me thanking myself in the third person, who books, produces, and directs the show. Please subscribe to the Hero Maker podcast wherever you listen and take a moment to rate us. It really helps the podcast grow. We're also on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at The Hero Maker Pod. If you'd like to collaborate or suggest a guest, please email us at media at theheromakerpodcast.com. The Hero Maker Podcast is a production of Prudent Pictures. Thank you so much for listening.